Welcome. It's the uh, October meeting of the Wisconsin chapter of the National Railway Historical Society. We'd like to uh, thank you all for being here in person and on the computer as well. So we got uh, a great evening of entertainment uh, of what we're calling the Railroad Mayhem Evening uh, coming up here for your, your enjoyment um, with uh, with <laughs> Enjoyment may not be the right word. Enjoyment, you know, and just the fact that um, there's a phrase that I saw in, in your description, men ground to pieces. That uh, That's not something you're going to hear all that often uh, here in a Wisconsin chapter NRHS meeting. So, uh, but we're going to have that tonight. So um, just a couple of announcements here. Uh, first of all, our next meeting, um, Friday, November fifth, I think it is, is uh, going to feature Brian Howell uh, from the Burlington Route Historical Society. He's going to be doing 300 miles of smiles. Um, the dome car uh, situation along the Mississippi River uh, in the height of the Burlington uh, and just before Amtrak. So we're going to uh, get a nice treat from Brian. Now that's going to be on Zoom, but Keith is going to be here in in this house here um, with the projector. So anybody who wants to see his presentation here in the room, Keith will be doing that for your edification. Otherwise, it'll be on Zoom. That's uh, Friday's uh, membership meeting. Then we're having a very special treat on Friday or on Saturday, November, November 13th. Uh, and that is a, a trip to the Christopher Transportation Museum. And let me see a show of hands, people in the room here. Who here has heard of the Christopher Transportation Museum? A couple of hands, but a lot of people have no idea what it is. And it's because it's not open to the public. It's a, it's a museum on the grounds of the Christopher Farm and Gardens. Jay Christopher is the proprietor. He's a collector of railroad dining car China. He has perhaps the world's largest collection of railroad dining car china. And um, <clears throat> uh, so we're, we're gonna have a very special treat. He's going to allow us to come in and, and tour his world-class but private museum on, on the grounds of a place that you ordinarily have no access to. So there will be more information coming your way to our members only um, on uh, the 13th of uh, November. And yes, you could bring your wives and it's a $10 donation, the donation that we're gonna uh, hand off to Sheboygan Meals on Wheels, which is uh, Jay Christopher's preferred charity. In December, we're having Kevin Keefe doing David P. Morgan's Milwaukee, uh, a series of photographs that could have been taken by David P. Morgan, but David P. Morgan wasn't known as a photographer. He was a writer, as we all know, the editor of Trains Magazine in the 1950s. What he could have done uh, after he was done working at 1027 North 7th Street, banging out some editorials for Trains Magazine. Well, he'd probably go to a tavern and then he'd probably go out and look at some North Shore action and some Milwaukee Road action and some Northwestern action down in the Lakefront Depot. So Kevin's gonna share you some photos of that era. And that's going to be, and this, is, this was actually the banquet speech at the NRHS convention here in Milwaukee in August. So it's gonna be expanded. So it's gonna be a, it's a good presentation. But before we do any of that, here later this month, uh, October 19th, it's Tuesday, we're having our uh, online slideshow. This is where we have five presenters, each doing 15 minutes uh, on a subject of their choosing. And that's starting uh, at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, the 19th of October. Jim Rint hasn't quite figured out what he's going to be pre presenting, but he's going to tell us soon. And uh, we also have uh, Alan Baker, uh, Brian Heckel, uh, Mike Slater, and Rich Peters are, are going to be uh, the five presenters for, for this um, on the, what do we say, the, the 19th of October. So uh, does anybody else have anything to say here? before we get rolling. Tara's here and she's gonna come around here and 
and, and talk right into this little thing here. <laughs> Mention that Harry Evans has some involvement with uh, the group in Oconomowoc. Hi, everybody. I got a, um, an email from Harry Evans, and he said uh, they have their seventh annual open house day uh, on November 6th. That's a Saturday. Uh, we will have our permanent layout operating, plus we'll have modular layouts, plus a lot of other exhibits and different items for sale. If anyone wants to pass the word on, uh, it's November 6th. It would mu be much appreciated. That's what you're doing. Yep. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the official word. That's the Oconomowoc uh, Historical see. Society. Yes. Oconomowoc mm -hmm. Historical. Yep. Is it at the depot? No. No. No, it's at the museum probably. Okay. Where it's out. based on the Milwaukee and Northwestern, and we call it Milwaukee Northwestern. Um, Oconomowoc Museum. Yeah, just south of the depot. Just south of the depot? Yeah. He didn't give me an address. Yeah, if you Google, uh, uh, thank you, Al. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Tara. Yep. <laughs> and, um, Somebody mentioned Cedarburg, and yeah, that. Thank you for the reminder. Cedarburg, uh, um, the Cedarburg train depot, the train station that had been in place up until 1983, was moved to Ozaki County Pioneer Village in the town of Sawkville. Then, um, it's, a, it's a ward of the Ozaki County Historical Society. They just had a rededication of that this week. Uh, we're going to have some pictures and sparks and cinders. But uh, they, they did a fantastic restoration. And if you ever have the opportunity, if it's open, uh, please uh, avail yourself of that. So, um, well, uh, so the question here is, uh, there are some trains going through Elm Grove on CP, um, blowing their whistles in a quiet zone, yeah. and, uh, which is unusual. And I don't know if anybody knows the, the actual full legitimate answer, but I can su surmise uh, because we live near the CP ourselves, um, we know when they're doing track work, uh, when there's track gangs out there, there's going to be a, occasional whistling, and that's probably what's happening. Yeah, well, they're, they're, this is track work season. The, yes, they, they, they are. They are. Al, Al Letterman just mentioned uh, that uh, because of the expansion of I-43 from Silver Spring up to Grafton. Uh, going from two to three lanes in each direction, they're going to, uh, it's going to require some, some bridge work, a new bridge, the Union Pacific former Northwestern bridge over I-43 will be replaced. Uh, and that'll be interesting because by then there won't be any coal trains. And so it'll be a three night a week, four night a week local. That's the only traffic that you're going to see on there. So, all right. So, uh, are you guys ready? Who's going to go first? Chris, I guess it's I guess I am. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, get started with our program here right now. And it gives me great pleasure here to present our presenters. Uh, first off, um, Chris Barney is here. And uh, uh, Dave Nelson is going to be doing some of the narration of Chris's program. A little bit. A little bit. And please give them a round of applause and welcome. Uh, am I okay now? All right. Um, anyway, um, we're hearing you. I just found out about this uh, tragedy uh, from the president of the uh, St. Francis Historical Society uh, in early 2019, and um, I was very familiar with the crossing on St. Francis Avenue. Um, so I just uh, shot it, and. Um, the first thing I got was from uh, what you had just seen on the screen was the, 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 the front page of the Milwaukee Journal from February 9th of 1924. And it gives a pretty detailed account of, of the crash. And uh, so uh, from that point, I went out and I started scouting around to see what I could see and take pictures of what I could find. And um, the uh, first picture that I I, I, uh, I'm going to show you is of the uh, the actual crossing on St. Francis Avenue. I took this in 2019. Obviously, it doesn't look anything like it did back in 1924. And according to Dave, um, 
where I was standing to take this picture was actually right on the old northbound train line, which which, which does not exist anymore. Um, and um, it's looking west at the and what you the tracks that you see, I think are the new tracks. Um, and this is uh, the new northbound track, I think. And um, the 1924, um, the crossing from 1924 was moved when uh, the uh, the Lake Parkway, the, the freeway was built. It goes south from the Home Bridge. And um, anyway, the original northbound track is, is under my feet, so you can't see it. Um, and I guess that's that's it for that photo. Okay. 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 Um, um, I don't know how much of the presentation people have heard. heard. I'm, standing I'm standing on St. Francis, Francis Avenue, Avenue looking, looking north. north. We're, we're at the new line. The point, the of, this point of this picture is, is you can, can see the signal bridge in the, in the distance in the photo near the St. Francis Tower, and you can see semaphore signals have been taken off of the far right-hand uh, signal post. That's where the train heading through St. Francis in 1924 would have been headed for right under those signals to reach the downtown depot. This picture exists only because it's St. Francis. This is a train on the new line heading north towards St. Francis Avenue. You can see telephone poles in the distance that are the uh, old line. Likewise, this is a train on the new line heading south, but you can see the pole lines to the right of the photo, which are the uh, remains of the line heading uh, north of the downtown depot that there would have been no reason for passenger trains to head north once the Northwestern switched its passenger trains um, uh, over to the Milwaukee Road Depot. They still would have gone through here, but by, uh, by Amtrak in the 1970s, uh, even that uh, routing would have been uh, unneeded. Now we are looking uh, at a... Uh, a sketch that was made as part of the coroner's jury because of the seven deaths. This is a drawing made by presumably the coroner in 1924. It shows uh, St. Francis Avenue uh, uh, at the very center of the drawing. He's written in the southbound, southbound and northbound North tracks, tracks, the sidewalk. He's made a star for the train which was stopped on the southbound track. And uh, uh, basically, this is the situation that would have been seen uh, in 1924 and was seen by the coroner's jury. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to Chris because the rest of the images he's going to be narrating. So uh, should Chris be sitting here? I, I can I can hold. Okay, okay um, I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I'll just give it a shot. Um, this, is this is the, the uh, view, view of uh, St. Francis, Francis Avenue. Avenue. Uh, it's uh, the train, the train, I believe, is crossing St. Francis Avenue. And um, I think you can see the watchman's shanty on the left-hand left side under the, the, uh, the, 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 the signal, signal pole. And then, and then on the, on the right hand, hand side is the depot, depot itself. Um, so I'm just, I'm just trying, trying to figure out where the, where the northbound is. That, that that's a southbound train. Right. right. And uh, the photographer was closest to the northbound tracks. Right. right. So, the so the northbound track, track is, the is the one that you see it to the left. left. And, and uh, uh, that, would that would have been the track, track that the express train was on. It, it, it would have been, been the track that the express train was on when, when the, uh, uh, the truck began, began to cross the, uh, the, uh, the tracks and, uh, and uh, was struck by the train. Okay, okay. Uh, this, uh, this is, is a, a um, front page from, from the, from the, the uh, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Journal, Journal uh, of the, the day following the, the crash. The crash. It was February 9th of 1924. And um, you, the pictures you can see on the front page 
or, or okay. of the uh, the tracks. And I think we're looking south or north. I think we are looking towards the from the south to the north as you can see the crossing connection. So we're looking north then. Right. Okay. And then um, below that you can see the remains of the truck. And there, there, there obviously wasn't much left of it after the train struck it. And it, it's actually a, incredible to me that one of the, 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 the newsboys that was in the back of the truck actually survived the crash. Um, and um, he, uh, he, was in, he was in the hospital for a long time, but he did come out of it. And uh, the sad thing is, is he only lived another 14 years after the accident. I don't know what he died from. He died at the age of 29. Um, and his name was, uh, hang on, oh, I lost it. Just, just a minute. His name was Gilbert Kaler. That's K-O-E-H-L-E-R. And uh, his brother, Vilas, was killed in the crash and he was so badly injured that nobody told him that his brother had died for, for several days until he started to recover. So he didn't know that his brother was killed. This is a sub headline on, on that uh, front page from the journal. And uh, it just kind of describes what, what exactly happened. The newsboys had been at a party and uh, it was for uh, for journal carriers, and um, it uh, was was smashed by the train, and the engineer saw the truck, but obviously going 50 to 55 miles an hour, there was no way he was going to stop, and uh, he gives he gives a, a description of the the engineer gives the description of the accident, and you can see the the, the text here. And uh, what, what, I, what I read, I think from the coroner's report is after he get, was able to bring the train to a stop, he got out and he walked around to the front of the, of the engine and there were two newsboys dangling from the engine. And then the rest of them were scattered about behind the train to the side. And uh, it was a horrific uh, situation. And uh, the uh, victims of that crash, they were newsboys who supplied the customers in the Fernwood section of Bayview and then Tippecanoe in the town of Lake um, and also in the southwestern edge of the city in the industrial plants. And uh, at the time of the accident, uh, the driver was, was in the process of taking them home. Now, I don't know where I read about the, how many how many boys were dangling, but uh, it was it was an ugly scene. Let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, a after they stopped, uh, they assessed the situation of the boys that were still living. They gathered them and put them into a uh, a rail car and uh, carried them down to the downtown uh, Northwestern Depot. By the time they got down there, I think they put four boys in the back of the, the rail car. By the time they got down there, uh, two more of them had died. And they took the remaining two that were living to hospitals. And one of them, Lester Holling, died upon reaching the hospital. And the other boy, Gilbert Kaler, um, I think they, they sent him to Milwaukee Hospital. If anybody is familiar with that name. And uh, he lingered near death for a few days, but then he started to, to, re to recover. And, um, but it was, it was just a terrible situation. Here's a little closer view of those photos that were on the front page of, the, of that journal from Saturday, February 9th. Um, it gives me the shivers just to look at the remains of that truck. I believe that's all that was left. I, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Seven people. It held, it held six newsboys and the, and the driver, I think. 
three, four. Or se seven newsboys and a driver. Six of the seven newsboys ended up dying. Do you want me to wait for mm -hmm. the okay? And these are these are pictures obviously taken when they were much younger of the uh, victims. And the, um, the 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 picture in the upper right uh, row was the driver Arnold Voigt. He was 26 at the time of his death when the, when the crash happened. Anything else? Okay. This was the uh, the watchman who was on duty at that crossing until 10 o'clock. And the only reason he was still there a couple minutes after 10 is because that express train was supposed to already have made its crossing across St. Francis Avenue, but it was late. So he called his supervisor and his supervisor told him to go on, go on home. So he headed down St. Francis Avenue to Kinnikinnick Avenue and waited for the streetcar. So he obviously must have been still waiting when the crash happened. Uh, his name was Carmelito Gutamando. I uh, believe at the time of this accident, he was uh, 59 years of age. This is a side story about two of the, uh, the, the carriers that uh, didn't go to that party. Because they didn't go to the party, they ended up obviously living. Um, one of the one of the boys was uh, babysitting for somebody, and when the people that he was babysitting for discovered that that there was a party for him to go to, they were going to let him out of babysitting, but he decided to, to continue with the babysitting, and that that saved his life. And the other one was a 22 year old young young woman, um, and she didn't go because apparently the party was only for boys. So uh, a little bit of discrimination there, but it saved her life. And then um, about five days after the accident, they started an inquest into the rail accident. And uh, some of the key points was that there was no watchman at the crossing. Apparently there had never been a watchman at that crossing between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. There was no gates at the crossing, no warning signals, no lights of any kind. And uh, it was estimated that when the train hit the truck, it was going about 50 miles an hour. Uh, and uh, the uh, watchman testified he had left the crossing about 10 minutes before the accident as he had called the supervisor. So he was standing two blocks away when the accident happened. Uh, these are members of the uh, coroner's inquest jury they went down to take a look at the accident scene. And I believe the gentleman on the left wearing the, uh, the Ivy League cap, uh, and he's got his hand up, he's gesturing. I believe that's the watchman from the uh, second shift, Carmelo uh, Tutamando, explaining uh, what the, uh, the scene was like. Uh, the, Railroad Commission, which is a precursor to, it's not called that anymore, is it? Well, it's still a railroad commissioner. But, uh, this will be the state. The state okay. railroad commissioner. All right. But anyway, um, the, uh, they scheduled a hearing on this tragedy and uh, it was supposed to be uh, the hearing was supposed to be set uh, at a date in the near future, but when this article came out, the, the, the hearing had not yet been set. Um, so uh, I guess that's it. So they, uh, when they had the coroner's jury inquest, it was determined that the Northwestern Railroad was responsible for the accident. And uh, the uh, the jury, after hearing the testimony of the trainman and the roadmaster, found that the seven persons came to their death through the failure of the Northwestern Railroad to provide protection in any form after 10 p.m. and before 6 a.m. at the crossing known as St. Francis Avenue in the town of Lake Milwaukee County. Um, this is just an inquisition 
page taken from the, 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 the coroner's uh, inquest. And uh, it uh, gives the names of the, uh, the victims and uh, also describes what uh, their findings were as far as uh, who was uh, responsible for the accident occurring. Uh, these are the names of some of the uh, commissioners on the inquest jury and uh, also the, uh, the coroner. Uh, now you're gonna see a couple of uh, death certificates. Um, this was for uh, Dale Clemens, who, who I believe may have been the youngest of the newsboys. He was only 12. Um, and uh, he lived on Chicago Avenue, which I think the name is different now, but I, I'm not sure it might be KK Avenue. But in any case, um, he, uh, he was born in Iowa. His parents moved to, uh, to Milwaukee. And then uh, it shows the cause of his death was accidental uh, while riding in the, in the truck that was struck. And that he, the contributory factor to his death was a fractured skull, which I, which I believe it said on all of the death certificates. Oh, the Undertaker? I recognize that name. Yeah, so they were around back then. Okay, this is um, one of the two Lobenhofer boys that, that died in this crash. This is a, a Lois Lobenhofer, he was 13. And uh, it's the same thing uh, he, uh, uh, he he was a schoolboy and he uh, died of a skull fracture. Uh, this is at Woodlawn Cemetery on East Howard Avenue. Um, this is the, um, the headstone for the Holling family. And the first name, which is kind of kind of blotted out, you can't really see it that well, is of Lester Holling, one of the boys who initially lived after the crash but died on arrival at the hospital. Uh, his name was Lester Holling. And uh, he also died at, at, at 13 years of age. Okay, um, these are the boys that um, were involved in the, in the tragedy. In the top row from left to right, uh, and obviously these pictures were taken years before. So they look much younger than they actually were when they died. Uh, the first one from left to right uh, is Vilas Kaler, who was 13. Next to him is Vincent Lobenhofer, who was 15. Next to him was Lois Lobenhofer, who was 13. Next to him was the driver, Arnold Voigt, who was 26. And uh, in the bottom row from left to right was uh, Dale Clemens, who was 12, and uh, Lester Holling, who was 13, and uh, Gilbert Kaler, the only survivor next to him, who was 14. And uh, I'm sorry, I, I must have missed the name. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, the, uh, the first boy in the bottom row on the left was uh, Michael Mohowski, who was 15. Then it was Dale Clemens, who was 12. And Lester Holling, who was 13. And uh, finally, the last one on the, on the bottom row was Gilbert Kaler, who was uh, 14. He was the only survivor um, after these accidents. So there used to be a, a number of these accidents every year. And um, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, about three weeks before this accident, a policeman was struck at the, uh, the same crossing and killed. Uh, but it was on the, uh, on the second shift uh, where the, uh, the watchman we showed you a picture of was on duty. But um, it was just a, a terrible tragedy. And uh, I thought it was just appropriate that we that we remember the the, uh, the lives of these boys, and that they uh, they had jobs and they were I'm sure looking forward to their future, which never happened. But um, I enjoyed I didn't enjoy it, but I mean I I, I got satisfaction out of uh, telling their story. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it.
Well, thank you, uh, Chris Barney. Uh, and we apologize there for uh, some audio issues. We think we have them all taken care of. Oh, that's uh, okay. Ward, would you give me a thumbs up if uh, if we sounded better toward the end of that? Uh, yeah, definitely, Mike. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. good, good, good. Yeah, it sounded like we had two right. mics so, going. Um, I'm just going to uh, take a moment here to switch switch uh, switch people around here, switch presenters. Uh, now, um, Dave Nelson has sat in front of Keith's computer.